How about hair? Can we put some hair on my hair on my yeah. hair? Yeah. Yeah, we can we can do some stuff in post for sure. Wanna make that paper? Wanna make that dough? This is the affiliate marketing show. Wanna make that paper? Wanna make that dough? What's up everybody? This is Josh coming to you with another episode of the affiliate marketing show. If you're not hip to offervault.com, make sure you check it out. We are your one-stop shop for all things affiliate marketing. Per usual, we have Adam Young, the CEO of Ringba, your number one call tracking platform for all your call tracking needs. We also have Harrison Gewurz, who I will remind you is not a marketing guru. And we also have Josh Album, the CEO of GRP Ads, an industry leading MarTech company providing automation technology, cohort driven analytics and digital customer acquisition programs, introducing consumers to advertisers. Their proprietary first party data sets, automated tech stack, diverse media and marketing reach enable them to acquire new customers at scale, delivering the right message to the exact audience at the right time. Yes, I was reading that off your website. Josh also has 15 years in the digital media space. What's up, Josh? How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. It's a pleasure having a, another Josh on the show. And before I forget, please make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date <laughs> on all the latest affiliate marketing trends, tips, and news. Josh, as I was saying before, it's great to have another Josh. Josh is, you know, we just kind of get it. You know, I don't know what it is, but all the Joshes I meet, they all seem to have this vibe. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you're you're in the family. Adam, why are you, why are you doing that? <laughs> there go all the listeners. <laughs> Yeah. Josh, where are you uh where are you talking to us from today? I am from uh talk speaking here from Anglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. I'm a New Jersey native, uh born and raised in Bergen County. Uh for all of you who don't know where that is, it's right over the, the George Washington Bridge. Well, let's jump right into it, Josh. What are some of the latest businesses that you've acquired recently? So we are focused primarily on uh affinity businesses that pretty much are in our investment thesis. And uh, we, we target them based on our AR and AP. There are people that we are working with. Uh, culture is paramount in what we're looking to achieve. Uh, it sounds, um, you know, it, it sounds quote unquote, you know, uh, corny, so to speak, but we, we really want to be with people who are tied to what we're looking to achieve and we have zero turnover in our business, meaning our company, we're like a family. Everyone who's been with us has been with us for since they started. So it's really a, an important aspect of what we're looking for in businesses who we are looking to bring on and bring into the fold. And for our listeners that aren't on video, you'll notice that Josh has beautiful painting behind him describing his culture at his office of gluttony, lust, greed, and wrath. And yeah. so if you're into that, Josh is buying businesses. <laughs> Those are the seven deadly sins of social media, gentlemen. <laughs> Very true. By the way, by the way, for anyone who's listening, we just met Josh because his business partner, Greg, who is our friend, refused to come on the podcast uh, for some reason. We stage can't fright, out why. stage fright. It's stage fright. It's got. He it. might. He said he might come on later, so we can make. Fun we of we him get it. This is a pretty that. high profile, extremely high, tra highly. When he's trafficked back, you know, maybe he'll pop in. So, Josh, can you tell us uh, specifically when you are acquiring companies? What are some of like the key metrics that you focus on to determine if it's worth your time? So, obviously, I mentioned they're small to medium sized businesses. They're 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 um, you know. Can you tell us what small to medium size means to you? Yeah. Well, really it's a, quick. It's a sole, it's a sole proprietor. If, People if in, the had, uh, in 30 seconds, what does GRP ads do before we talk about how you buy businesses? Because you mentioned that you look at your ARAP and that's how you decide or find right. targets. So we're but, primarily, we're, we're prim that's a good question. We're primarily focused in, in, in financial services, jobs, and education. During, during COVID, education was a really big eye-opener for us as things were moving and transitioning to online. Um, and, and there was a lot of exposure in what uh, EDU, the value, the creation value of EDU, you know, so you, you can go to Michigan University and you could spend $60,000, but you can go to some, you know, an online education uh, university and get a, a degree in medical billing and coding 
And, and that would be a very good degree to service your needs and to be able to grow into your, um, your goals. So we, we were already working in education. Um, we were servicing uh, customer acquisition programs for a lot of clients. And we took that as an opportunity to really double down in that space. And that's a big focus for what we're looking to achieve. So going back to Adam's question, you said small to medium sized businesses, um, you know, and then Harrison just jumped in. So it's okay. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, we've all been in the lead gen space for a long time. It's, it's, it's pieces to the puzzle of you know, single proprietors who are doing a lot of things on their own, have no access to real um, and, we're, we're there. We're doing business with them. We know them. We've done business with them for a long time. Uh, we're, we're working with them. We're either paying them or they're paying us and they're, um, and they're a culture fit. And I know I keep saying that, but that's really the one thing that I've learned as we have acquired businesses, which is you really want to do business with people that you really like and you can stand and you're going to be around because making money with, with, People who you cannot stand or or you do not want to work with could be the worst dollars you ever bring in. Yeah, and yeah, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. It's just not. It really isn't. And if you've been in this space for as long as I think we've all been in this space, you can you know you, you could. I I trust someone as far as I can throw them. For example. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's a good. So way. so what you're saying is you trust a newborn baby a lot more than an older adult man. No. Okay, cool. <laughs> Anyways, moving right along. Uh, wow, what, okay. Yeah. yeah well, well, that was like, that was a throwing, <laughs> that was a throwing baby joke. I thought that would get some laughs, but you Aren't know, you, you never one know. with the wife who's pregnant right now. Yeah. Yeah. Just tell the whole world, Adam. Appreciate that. Anyways. Um, <laughs> what are some of the biggest, <laughs> what are some of the biggest challenges that you face when you're acquiring these companies? And I kind of want to throw it to Adam and Harrison as well, because I know they're in the acquisition space themselves. So Josh, let's start with you. When you are looking to acquire companies, what are some of the roadblocks that you consistently run into and how do you deal with those? We, we really try to bring a human element to the acquisition process, which we've learned that everyone has a subjective nature or, or realization that this is their business and they hold it tight to their vest for many reasons. And you have to really bring that human element to speaking uh, to a prospective acquisition, because that is how I think you really create value and, and, and bring the partnership aspect, because these are people's babies. These are these are businesses that they've grown from zero to wherever they're at. And and I think if you really create that human element and and bring to the table an understanding that uh, that we're trying to enhance what they've only built, that's something that we that we've learned is is very important as you as you speak to to um, you know prospective acquisitions, and more, more so than anything. Adam, tell us about your uh, your biggest challenges with some of the acquisitions that you guys have faced over at Ringba. So I think the human element is a really good point. Let me give you a really specific example. So not that too long ago, we acquired TCPA.com. And I had been, first of all, tracking down the owner of that was uh, a nightmare in a process. Took me quite some time. And then finally, I tracked him down. I found him on LinkedIn. I verified he was the dude. I hit him up on Skype. And we ended up chatting for on and off, like not every day, but like on and off for three years. And I just took the time to get to know him a little bit, talked to him during COVID, like tried to make friends. And, and I think the reality is he knew I just wanted to buy TCPA.com, but I think as, and this guy's a, a pretty prolific domainer, I think in his world, you know, he he just gets tons of offers for, for his very large domain portfolio, and he doesn't really want to sell anything. And so the first hurdle is to sort of connect with the people on something. It's that human element, you know, like, am I selling this to someone that I at least right. think is cool? Right. Yeah. And it's, it's the, am I willing? It's the... Yeah, exactly. Like, am I willing to like, 
to like help this person out. Because if you have a business and it's successful and you don't need to sell it, the reality is that you only want to, you're going to sell it to someone you like. And if the deal terms work, um, Look, I think so it's, no the, it's no different. It's no different. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, it's no different than being a good salesman, right? Because we all do business mm -hmm. with people who we like and who we who we trust and who we want to believe that we can do more with and we can have fun hanging out with and we can have levels of communication with. And it it doesn't it doesn't change. It doesn't change. Now the only difference is is you're going to be you're going to be um, in in a deeper relationship with someone who you're going to acquire. So those are you're getting married in some some you know in, in in some shape or form, and I think GRP makes a point to bring that humanization to the table. Like this is this is we're in this together, and, I, and we both have to want to do this. Yeah, I, and I think for some of the acquisitions that you guys do, you're talking about keeping these people on your staff. In my example, that wasn't there, but the, the reality was what was interesting, Josh, is the question that I got asked before we did the deal was, is this for you or are you just going to try and resell this thing? And uh, we had some rapport in a relationship, and I believe my response was verbatim like, no, dude, this is for me. Right. And um, he said, okay, cool. Well, your offer's not good enough. Here's the price. This is the price. Either take it or leave it. And I took it um, and I, I was really happy with it. And we haven't put anything up there, but if the gentleman is watching, I promise you still own it. It's in the name chief account. We're not, it's not That's going good. anywhere. Um, you're, a man of your word. You're, you're a man of your word. Yeah, exactly. I, I have no interest in, in selling it at all. And we're going to keep it and, and develop the property. And, um, but I, I think that, you know, when you have the conversations and you have to, you have to like, it's never a short process. And you have to be really well aware of, um, especially if you're going to keep team members on uh, or if they have a lot of clients or something of that nature, that you really have to empathize with the owner and you have to really care about the customers. You have to really care about the success of the business. You have to really care about the legacy of it, right? Like, yeah. are you going to treat it just That's as well exactly. as the person you're buying it from? Yeah. And, and there's a vet. I was, was going to chime in that. That legacy aspect is is the reason why a lot of people will just say, no, I'm not interested because they believe that that they run it a specific way and they fear that a new, you know, new management's going to ruin it and ruin the culture and ruin that legacy that they've spent years developing the rapport with clients, the rapport with team members, mm -hmm. the reputation of whatever it may be. Um, and it's that human element, that connection with, where you can essentially develop a relationship and make them comfortable with your plan. So if you can paint the vision as to what your plans are with that business in a way that makes them see that they're going to get a big check at the end of the day and that you're going to make it possible for maybe the people that will be staying on board grow, it will make them comfortable and open-minded to doing a deal. Yeah. And I think, I think it all comes, it's all cyclical and it's full circle because if you have that human element, and and you and you have a relationship or or rapport with these prospective acquisitions or sales or whatever it is you're talking to, that lends itself to the ability to give autonomy to be able to run the business that you're buy. You know, you're you're either doing a sale or you're acquiring someone because they're good at what they do and they're and they're an expert in their field. And at GRP, everyone's an expert in in whatever field they're in or whatever skill set they're doing. And so we're, we're bringing on skill sets and we're bringing on experts. And if someone can't, if you don't have the trust and you can't have that conversation up front, then you're never going to, they're never going to feel the autonomy to be able to run their business as if they did when they were by themselves. Something I really like about your model, Josh is, um, and Greg never told us this, we would ask him questions and like try and help him out and figure out how, you know, how we could like help your business grow. But he just, you know, he talks about nonsense. So we never got anywhere. Um, but I really love your, your model about how you're buying and acquiring businesses that you have a, a financial relationship with already, because you're already doing business with them. And so maybe, and hopefully you've had a few speed bumps. I think, 
I think, you know, for the affiliate audience, when they're thinking about buying something or they're thinking about doing business, I've seen a lot of them freak out when they have a speed bump. But a speed bump's a good thing because you get to work through it with somebody right. and make the relationship better. So I really love that you guys are looking at your um, your your partners uh, to do that. Also, to vertically integrate what you're already uh, working with anyways. I think that Correct. is a is a really cool way to do it. So I do have a question for you, Josh. Um, what are some of, like, let's say, for instance, you have uh, a potential acquisition, and right now, I think we can all agree that the, the market for acquisition valuations is pretty toxic. You have Silicon Valley Bank failing, you have, like, the crypto market failing, you have the Fed raising interest rates to obscene amounts, the housing market's a mess. I mean, it's just... The VC market has been destroyed, right? Like it's kind of a shit show if you're selling a company right now. So I know a lot of entrepreneurs are placing really big valuations on their business. Give me some some ideas uh, on how you handle the negotiation process to find, you know, a happy medium where <laughs> I think best case scenario is where all parties are pissed off about the price, right? So how do you get to that place? Uh, I got to be honest with you. We kind of, what I've learned, and this is the long answer of it, but I think you'll, you'll respect where I'm coming from is what I learned earlier in my career is if you negotiate just to negotiate, you're going to create two things, brain damage and no <laughs> deal. You're just going to do it. And if you're a, as direct right off the bat, to a prospective acquisition, you know, we at GRP believe that right away, what are you what are you looking for? So we understand what the established benchmark is. And if it's something that is in outer space, we're way out of we're way out of whack. If it's something that is within reason and within within you know the parameters of having a discussion around, then okay, then we then we've established that. But at least we've established that before we've gotten to wasting time and vetting and dancing around and doing all these things. And then someone comes back and says they want some astronomical number for their business because I've just, I've just wasted your time. We've wasted a bunch of people's time. And that's not, that's not how we, how we operate and how, and, and the type of reputation or culture that we want to establish here at GRP. Josh, have you ever had an acquisition fall apart? Like in the 11th hour where you're like, this is a done deal. I can't wait. And then something came out of the blue and just turned it upside down. No, we, we, we try to do a, we try to do a really uh, tight job in, in analyzing and taking the methodical steps of, of understanding all the minutia and, and approaching it as such and, and uh, making sure that as many of the details are ironed out before the 11th mm -hmm. hour. Um, I'm not to saying uh, here, I'm not sit here and say that I don't think I'll never experience that because I think I, I think I will as as and I think we will as 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 a company me me and as a professional but we as GRP so but we haven't had that happen. You know, Adam, we've we've done some deals over the years and we've had initial conversations where numbers are presented to us and they're more in Mars, not on Earth. Um, and I think our strategy has been to essentially explain why those numbers are outside of the realm of realistic um, in a polite way, in a kind way. Um, and I think you just can't do that in the 11th hour once this is more like the second hour after the first date, you know? A, a, a um, wise man once told me that the most objective thing in this world is mathematics. And math Math never lies. One plus one is always going to be two, and two plus two is always going to be four. And if you spell out and you can illustrate why the math demonstrates this outcome, you've take taken a lot of the emotional emotional aspect of what you're For what sure. both parties are trying to achieve out of it. And that's how we 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 try to establish two lanes. We love each other. We want to be in business together. We were this is the human element, but here's the math. And if it doesn't work out, let's continue to do everything that we're doing together. But if you cross those those streams, that's when things can become. That's the, it's that happy medium about 
you know, making sure, like I said, you know, this is someone's baby. You got to make right. them comfortable with, right. with, you know, passing the torch. Right. But also, you know, everyone has a number. <laughs> yes. Well, that leads me to my next question. I was going to ask, what happens when you can't establish that human element? Um, is it a deal that you're just like, well, without the human element, there is no deal? Or is there yeah, always a number deal. regardless? There's no deal. There's no deal. There's no deal. So like, if you love this business, you have to have it. No human connection. You just don't care anymore. It's for, gone. For where, we're, for where we're at right now, yeah. the most important thing that we want to bring into the fold is people. Mm -hmm. yeah. because, because a business without the person running it is not the business. Yeah. So yeah. You, I always, you, I was uh, talking to someone about this recently, Josh, and we were looking over um, some financial statements and my comments was essentially like when you val for that specific deal, when you value this thing, and I was talking to a friend, um, you really have to look at whether or not the person running the business can get hit by a bus. And if they can get hit by a bus and the business will still be bigger six months from now, you know, sure. You got then, a target. then you can, yeah. yeah, exactly. Then you can talk about, you know, more, more long-term valuations or, or multiples on that business. But if it's a smaller business where the key people, uh, if they get hit by a bus, the business fails, that's really a risk factor more than anything. And it has to, to fit in there. So, and that has a lot to do with that specifically the, you know, what we call the, the key man clause. Right. But there's also mm -hmm. to answer the, the initial question, I think is the human element that we, the, we d define the human element as, which is the culture fit is, do I want to work with this per person? Do I like hanging out with this individual? Are they, do they come from the same cultural you know, morals that we have? Okay. Your business could do uh, be amazing, but if that's not a fit, we're going to pass. And we're consistent in that. So how does Greg still have his job? I'm curious. Like, you seem like a really amazing dude who, like, Thank cares you. about people and culture. I know. We, we, like, we, we, we got to we gotta look at our friend circle. What the fuck? Yo, Greg's a big fan of the show. I feel like he's going to have trauma after watching this. He's not going to want to watch Greg it. Greg cares nah. a lot about a lot of people, too. He just has a funny way of showing us Josh, you talk about company culture a lot. So I want to know, you know, you've touched on it a little with the human element, right? So can you tell me specifically, like, what is the concept of company culture mean to you? Tell us a little bit about the company culture at GRP and as well as like someone who might be running a company with a shitty culture, like what are some actionable things that you would recommend they can do to really turn that around? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So this business, we we started this business back in 2010. It was it was part of a joint venture that we were um, working with in the UK, and one of the other companies was was primarily servicing customer acquisition in the US. And we, we rolled it all up, and we've created GRP. And um, I've come uh, as a part of that roll up, and to just give a little bit of insight as to how. What, how, how I would define the company culture is I came in as a minority partner as part of that. And I worked myself up within the organization because they provided me the runway to become CEO and an equal partner. And I think there are a lot of company cultures that say they will do that, that will give you the ability to grow. And you look back and you're sitting there five years later and you're in the same seat in the same job with the same boss saying the same thing. And that is not what we do here at GRP. We give the employees full autonomy and the ability for growth within the organization. And that is why we retain a hundred percent of everyone we've ever brought in. And so how do you execute upon that specifically, Josh? Like when you say you give them free reign, when an employee has free reign and they're responsible for a project, what are some of the things you're looking for um, for them to grow specifically? Like, I don't know if you're yeah. comfortable giving some yeah, examples, look, I but I, think, I would love to yeah, unpack I, it. I think there are, so there, there's another team member who was, was has been a part of this organization since its inception. And he started off on the email team and then he taught himself how to, he wanted to come Self had a code. So we gave him the ability in school to so code. He wanted to learn MySQL. And then 
he became a MySQL and data engineer. And then that individual grew and transformed his skill set and is now our CIO. So, you know, and if and if if individuals want to take on specific skill sets because they want to further their their craft and their ability to grow within the organization, we will send them to whatever trade show they want to do. We will pay for whatever they course they want to take because we believe that if we have to go hire someone who might be a um, a risk to bring into the you know to the to our culture who could potentially be a cancer on the organization or whatnot. We might, I want to invest in the people we have. There's someone, for example, came in as an ad ops guy and he was amazing. So we promoted him to, he still does ad ops, but essentially he's in charge of like a lot of affiliate relationships. And I think, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Um, but I think, it, I think it, it gives insight. You're basically, okay. Yeah, you're basically saying that you're willing to to invest in the people that are on your team, but to achieve that the outcome you're talking about, the requirement is that they pick up new skills, which then lead to new value to the organization and allows them to create more value, uh, essentially, you know, inbound dollar flow. And as they, you know, increase that and add more value to the organization, more doors open. Essentially. And I think as 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 team members and specific individuals within the organization here at GRP um, take it upon themselves to create ownership of something, that is what we really like. Create ownership because ownership creates value, intrinsic value for you to really inhib inhibit growth within the organization because you own something, you create it, you like it, you want it, you're competitive about it, you you you're competing to against yourself to make it better. And we, and we, so, yeah. Yeah. So then, um, so then this is the kind of culture that gets excited about someone who learns a new skill and unlocks a new revenue stream. And then you guys will take the risk on that person potentially uh, maybe even failing, trying to open up that new revenue stream, but, but give them enough rope so that they can effectively, uh, create something new. And then once, obviously it's performance based, right? So once something new is created, right. that's when the opportunity for their, their advancement and growth. Right. Over. Let's support someone. Let's build out someone underneath, um, you know, them let's, let's give them the support because I think it's important to answer your first question or your initial question, I shouldn't say first question, but if they, if, if, if our team members see that we're willing to invest in them, they will invest in us. And it's always true. I've worked at other companies that I've felt wouldn't invest in what I thought was a good idea, even though I put together a plan and a business model. And it's because either you're too young or they just view you as, you know, that's your role. And I think that's how, I think that's how companies create high turnover. And I think it's why some companies might not be as successful as they could be. Yeah. And I also think it's fostering people to take that initiative because I think the initiative to create something new is also very hard to foster. But when someone when someone jumps on it and does create something new, I think that's that's like the coolest thing ever because it creates mutual value for everybody involved. A business grows. You can add more team members, create you know more job opportunities like that's making the world a, a better place, essentially. Right. And look, training and development. I've come from organizations that have prided themselves on training and development, right? But that becomes a bureaucratic mechanism in and of itself. I think if you really care about training and development, you will you will take the time, whether it's in a in some type of documented form with a review or just taking the time to sit with the person and explain why the email they just sent could have been better. That's training and development. You don't have to wait to have a review to sit Consistent down to have the person right write out everything. No, you sent an email, come into, you know, let's talk about some of the things that could have been better and why. Josh, what's Maybe. your, uh, oh, I was just going to ask how many people are on your team at GRP ads? How frequently are you adding new people to the team? And specifically when you are adding new people, what are some of the things you're looking for in these, in these possible uh, future employees working with you? Yeah. I mean, we're, 
think we're now we're at about maybe 30 people and um, it's evolved over the, over, over the years. We, we really want to tie as many people to a profit and loss management as we can uh, to revenue, because I think that's the biggest, uh, so to speak, indicator of performance. Obviously, we're always building tech. We always want to find tech. That's, I'm sure everyone on this phone call will agree. It's, it's hard to find uh, resources tech that fit culture, so to speak, because some some individuals aren't as outgoing and as things have moved more remote from a culture standpoint. But as far as new hires that are tied to revenue, it's it's ownership, it's sales, it's P and L development. Those are the things we look for relationship management. We just did something similar, actually, Josh. We just took our, um, so we revamped our mission and values, which is something that's really important to me. And um, we then tied those mission and values to uh, our P&L, but also uh, team performance reviews and created a, what we call the senior leader um, quarterly bonus, basically. Uh, and so we look for the people on our team that are leading by example, that are creating new value, that are um, investing in other team members, right? Like we believe a lot in leadership and we expect everyone on our team to either be a leader today or be striving to lead a team, right? Like we never want someone sitting in the same seat permanently. And um, I thought it, I thought it was really cool. Uh, I don't know if we've actually announced it yet, but that's that's okay. This doesn't get released until uh, after it'll it, it'll be announced. But I think it's really great you guys do that. And I too am always looking for ways to tie performance to company performance and reward the people that um, are leading by example. And I don't mean like toxic rock star culture where you're right. just like trying to underpay people to grind them into the into yeah. their desk and give them free beer on Fridays. So right. like they no. think they have perks. No. Craft no. kombucha is very popular. <laughs> Look, I think, know, keg, I, keg kombucha. I think I think, you know, the more Adam speaks about this is is exactly correct. There there are there are two reasons why people come to work. And I think if people if if organizations like GRP understand that they'll be more successful people come to work to to make money for their livelihood and to be around a culture that they're probably around more more often than they are their family sometimes and you have to you have to weigh that balance and you have to know what drives people to mo and to motivate people it's certainly aspect is money right but a lot of it's if you can create a good culture, and I know I keep coming back to this, that will make them want to get up and come to work and do good things. It just does. Josh, do you do a lot of like team building kind of stuff where you yeah. guys will do? Yeah. yeah so like, two. what are what are some of the stuff you do as a company to kind of build that repertoire with everybody so in there? We try to do every quarter. We have big company meeting. Everyone comes in uh, or or an offsite where we're we're all together and then so that that's happening for sure we want everybody coming together being together as often as possible and and then our our different acquisitions fly up come down i come down you know you have to you have to make the the effort both ways it can't just be you know a team member flying up all the time they need to see that the ceo of the company is going down there is making that effort that's part of the culture right i'm not afraid to get on a plane once a month and go visit you so we make it a point so that everyone is seeing each other i think facetime is very important to have with one another especially since covid and i think you know the communication is also important to make sure that people aren't siloed sitting on an island by themselves uh, as, as, as team building goes on, which is I'm as accessible as anyone and we're all accessible. And if you, you, if organizations start to block off the access to some of their key executives, I think that creates problems. And I think that creates team building because someone's afraid to have a conversation with someone. We don't want, we don't want people to be disrespectful or have, have the fear of that they could be disrespectful, but we want them to be 
it's an open door, you know, the, the old saying of an open door policy here. Um, and the more that people are, the more that our team members are around everyone at every level, that creates excitement, it creates accessibility, and it creates a positive culture. Also keeps everyone in line with your vision. Right. 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 So yes, yesterday, Google uh, came out with their chat AI uh, bard. And Josh, I know you guys do a lot of automation technology incorporated in GRP ads. So I just wanted to get your take on the AI chatbots that are coming out, um, how you think Bard will compete with chat GPT. And uh, if you guys see yourselves implementing any of that technology within your own business practices going forward. Yeah, we're very bullish on AI. We're very bullish on chat GPT. We, we, we're using it here. Uh, currently testing new new creatives, new content. Uh, so can I'm you not, tell me like a real world example? Like how are you using it there? Like, I mean, we're, I, I give you as much detail as I think. Um, so we're, we do email here. We do email marketing, right? So we've tested the chat, chat G, G, D, GBT on email creatives. We've tested it on our own so operated web property. You're using it to actually write creative. Yeah, ab you absolutely. Say, and we're, yeah, and you we're say, testing. hey, I got this I got this insurance offer. Write me an email creative yeah. to sell people auto insurance. It's, it's and, creating and it's doing it. It's creating efficiency. It's creating efficiency. How does it among... compare if you if you were to take, well for two questions. So do you have to have a human edit it or if you didn't do that how far off is it from being like a kick-ass creative? It's is there any metrics? Almost ninety-nine percent accurate, <laughs> which Fuck. is unbelievable. We there are wow. we obviously honored it. We want to make sure that the the it's grammatically correct. It's thematic with what we're actually wanting to put out from a vertical perspective. But wow. uh, AI is going to be the future. Elon Musk talks about it. There are a lot of uh, bigger. Uh, entrepreneurs in, in the tech sector that talk about it and we're very bullish on it here at GRP and I think it's going to continue obviously Microsoft bullish on Microsoft Microsoft is first has first market mover advantage I'm not too intricately in 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 the know on on the Google one I know that from what I've read and, and heard it's not nearly as accurate I think as as Microsoft's version and I think look I mean their AI has been around with Google's I think Gmail several years ago, when you start typing an email, it's finishing your 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 sentences. So True. they're 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 coexisting in, in some level. And um I, I think look, I think it's Google. I'm I'm uh, they're gonna figure it out. I don't know to what niche that might service, whether it's within leveraging YouTube and how new new content gets thrown out there to write scripted shows or whatever it might be for YouTube TV, or they have obviously search. Their, their search, I know Bing Bing AI just launched, I think this week, um, where they were in beta having consumers test questions in their extension, in their browser extension, which is super cool and super accurate that someone could literally speak a question into a search engine and it's going to return all these things. I mean, that opens up a whole new world of, of search. But AI here is... is uh, is, a, is on the forefront of what we're looking to achieve and how we're looking to grow. You know, Josh, I, uh, Josh Sebo, I saw a tweet this morning that I thought was really interesting where someone in the Bard beta asked Bard, um, it, I think it was a specific prompt to get around some of the restrictions, but yeah. essentially asked it what training data was used to train Bard. And Bard literally spit out that it was like, oh, Gmail. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, oh, great. Shit. I read that. I read. I read this. I read the same thing. It's because look, Jesus. I, I don't. I don't know. Um, we all we all have a suspicion, right? But there, there's this technology has been living within the walls of these companies for a long time. We're we're just mm -hmm. we're just seeing it now, right? So it's 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 been in their ecosystem. However, they're using it. However, they've used it to become super successful. And everyone here is, I think, can agree. We're both bullish on on Google and, and Microsoft. Obviously, Microsoft more so now with this leader in this technology and first market mover advantage. But 
we're just seeing it now. So the, I, 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 Adam, I, I, I agree with you. I found that comical because it's, it's, it was already there and who knows what they used it to leverage from the conversational aspect of everyone using Gmail. Of course. Yeah. Some, and some of the, not only, oh, go not ahead, only that, yeah, not only that with Google's acquisition of deep mind years ago, and we talked about this on another episode, they've already used their AI to make billions of dollars in refining the suggested YouTube videos to get right. people more engaged, to stay on this, the, the site. They've already used it to optimize their data center organization to bring their power consumption costs down. I think to your point, what we don't know is while OpenAI and Microsoft have made chat GPT and that's been their focus on the large language model, we don't know what Google actually has and what a lot of their modeling technology I, is. I doing. was going to say the same thing. This right. is just their first public facing product. I, I heard, you know, and this is just rumors, but like a month ago or maybe two months ago when chat GPT was really kind of taken off, like that supposedly Google's technology is, is substantially ahead of what chat GPT is doing. I just don't think they've they've pulled the curtain back all the way. They're just kind of giving us a taste. Well, that's what I was going to mention. Some of the differences that I saw online is that, you know, Google's connected to the search engine, right? So it can pull data out of Google in real time while it's giving you its responses. Whereas chat GPT is going off of like a knowledge base from September of 2001, somewhere at the end of 2001, which I'm sure will get updated, you know, at some point, or they'll connect it to a search engine. I think, on, and I think you're right with that. And I, and I didn't mean to interrupt you. But oh, no, so, no. Just, just so good. I remember before the no hair on my head, you know, starts to seep in and I lose my memory here is, uh, and I think that's why the fluidity among, of, of why chat GBT right now with some of the things that I know and, be, and been privy to with regards to BART or however you say it, is that, Google's form is so technical that it might be using fracture, fractures of phrasing, so to speak. So it's not as fluid where Microsoft is using something that has a more natural language or linguistic ability. So why it flows, at least right now, um, as, as we're testing it. Josh, you mentioned the future is AI, right? More or less. What does that future look like to you? I think here you know, GRP, it, it, it looks, I, so a human doesn't have to make a decision, right? There's no one here pressing a button or making a decision on the RFM of how the performance or delivery or mechanism that happens. And, and everyone's here is just is analyzing data. Well, that's super interesting to coming make better decisions, super interesting coming from you just with the importance of the human element. So don't you feel like the human making a decision is a big part of having that human element attached to the business or not? They're still making decisions. They're making decisions and analyzing data and being able to digest that data to enhance what we're doing. How can we tweak the algorithm better? How can, how can we add a different vertical that we're seeing that might be agnostic to what we're doing here? I'm not talking about replacing, or we're not talking about GRP, replacing individuals with robots. We're literally just trying to become That's more what efficient. they all say, Josh. That's what they all say. <laughs> no, they just turn into strategy, right? right? Like if you have your 20 years of experience and you're doing ad ops or whatever it is right. today or email copy, the guy doing email copy just changes and has to learn the skill to be an amazing you know, chat prompter. Linguist. And then now he's a linguist doing, now, right? Yeah. Now he's doing. Now he's doing the twenty times as many split tests, doing right. the same amount of work. It's almost like uh, you know, we're all old school affiliate guys. Like back in the day, we'd hit up a website owner and ask to place a banner on it to like make four cents a click, and we were fine with that. And then. You know, display networks came out and then ad exchanges came out. And now we're like, hey, we still do the same thing. We just don't manually reach out to the, the website owners. We just learn the new technology that drives it forward. And we still push the strategy. Exactly. And and look, there, you know, one of my mentors, he, he faster, faster. We need to do things faster. We need to be. Mm -hmm. we, so your output through AI just allows you to be faster. It allows you to 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 churn out more uh creative to get rid of creative that might not be performing to the, to 
throw up websites faster. It's, it's all about efficiency. It really is. To Adam's point, you're 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 just you're using the same. Think of it like this. Think of it as a graph, okay? Where your business is going to grow, not at a hockey stick level growth, but it's going to grow, and you don't have to add one other person to your business because every piece of technology that you've layered on it from from an AI standpoint, literally the output is ten to one or whatever that ratio is that you've had. So that's really that's that's how it works. It's a win-win for everyone, including the person that's output is yeah. drastically increased. Do you, you think there? We uh, we recently put out a uh, predictive routing technology, which uh, we haven't really announced yet, but whatever. And it's so, okay. I haven't told many people that my wife's pregnant. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, just go for it. <laughs> yeah, fuck it. We'll just put out their new bonus program, predictive routing. Yeah, so we have a bunch of customers that are in this predictive routing beta. And I, I know you're not really familiar with our tech, but essentially we try to drive a phone call to a call center that has the highest likelihood of converting it to a revenue event, right? Yep. And so our new predictive routing essentially does this automatically for our customers and predicts where these calls are going to have the highest propensity to convert. And the results have been rather astounding. Uh, I think it was... 12% increase in revenue per call was the bottom guardrail and the top was like 96% increase in revenue per call. And the interesting thing about this is um, I met with some of our customers at LeedsCon just this past week. And one of them said, uh, one of them joked that he got to fire two people because of predictive routing. And it was only a joke. Um, he said, in reality, what happened is these people were doing our optimization and now I have them working on other things and so their their costs their their revenue went up their profit went up and then they got to reassign two humans to more productive tasks what? and those humans you know probably make 100k a piece on his team so that was an additional two hundred thousand dollar lift by just reassigning the talent um and it was kind of an, an incredible outcome and you know we really look forward to uh releasing this tech to the market here pretty soon because it's just going to be like a fundamental paradigm shift in, in having to, do, I don't think anyone's going to fire anyone. They just don't have to no. do this manual labor. And, and I anymore. think, and I think Adam, you're, you're hitting on something that's very important that a lot of people who don't really intricately understand call center. I do. I come from that background and you, you, so call center is about the micro. If you're not in the micro for call center, you're, you're just not, you're, you're missing things. And when you understand call center and understanding the micro within call center, then if you can give your agents or a business can give their, their agents the calls that only the consumers are the ones that are going to answer or want to speak to, <laughs> then boom, keeping the agent pool the same, you've increased your leads per hour or sales per hour by probably a 5.0. You probably went from a 1.5 to a 5.0. You didn't do anything. You just changed the data. Yeah, this tech's going to make people literally billions of dollars. It's Am crazy I, to say you agree, it. You I almost want to do, do my fucking Dr. Evil thing over <laughs> here. But no, legit, over time, it's going to result in billions of dollars in increased revenue with no additional cost simply by optimizing the flow of these calls. It's really incredible. Right. Do, do you think there is a negative element associated to it in terms of some people having their jobs at risk being replaced like a content writer those are the, like i i think that the people who are scared of this it, you gotta learn sink or swim baby adapt you can be you can find a way to be beneficial to what's happening and not lose your job so like a content writer maybe they their role will change and they're not necessarily writing ad copy, but they're QAing what's produced and then essentially improving the algorithms that produce that content. I think it goes back to ownership. My, my yeah. original thing of ownership. If you own something, and even though now maybe you own something that had 10 steps before and now it only has three steps, but you're still owning it. You're still making sure that it produces the outcomes that need to be produced. You're scaling it. You're involved. You're communicating. I think then then you you've proven your value and and the organization should appreciate that value and will realize that. I always wonder about that, Josh. Like 
are the people who, com who are, are concerned about a robot taking their job, are they the, one are they the ones that jump out of their seat and run to their team leads and go, guys, this is going to replace my job. I want to learn these four things. I want to help the company grow. How do I get on this team over here? What do I need to do it during nights and weekends to make myself smarter so I can add more value? Like, those people, uh, <laughs> they don't usually exist. But if they did, they wouldn't have to worry about losing their jobs. It's just something about identifying and then going, trying, and making yourself better. That well, really I think you're unlocks. bringing up a good. I think you're bringing up a good point, Adam. Is which most most people that I that I think we can agree with on this phone call that have that thought usually don't verbalize it. Right? They have the thought. They're an introvert. They've sat in their chair. They're panicking. They're freaking out. And they're not, they weren't taking ownership before and they're not taking ownership now. And then that becomes a problem. And I think yeah. as, as you grow within an organization, you have to identify those certain skill sets and match them to specific things. And, and, and as, as Josh was saying, I think finding the ability of the skill sets within your team to, pivot of where certain thing certain people might have different roles as things evolve and i think that's important for an organization i think it's important for an organization who wants to keep the culture that they've established yeah and if you have really good talent you don't want to lose it anyway right I mean, if you're hiring a bunch of c and d players sure but different if story. we introduced yeah if we introduced tech at ringba that phased out a portion of our team that team wouldn't get let go we would immediately find something different for them to do because they're all amazing people right and so we've like already put the time in to find the amazing people we just have to uh you know just be like hey guys new mission and they'll be all over it so what's the hardest thing uh, to do in a business find good people yeah exactly for sure josh i got one more question for you before we let you get out of here and sure. you've been a fantastic guest and i'll say it again hopefully um, that's true and you're not lying to me no no definitely you sure definitely better than good. greg <laughs> Well, I don't yeah, know, I know Greg, Greg, so I can't say that. Fired from podcasts. <laughs> it's too bad he didn't make it on. I was going to ask, you know, ChatGPT first mover, right? Google Bard just released for beta yesterday. Um, you mentioned Bing. Like, how many more of these chatbot AIs do you think we're going to see? And is there going to be enough room for them all to be successful, just like all these search engines exist? Are they going to have to figure out a way to differentiate themselves? What's the future in terms of these big, big players trying to get into the market, as well as I'm sure some small, smaller players in the future? I think it's a great question. Um, you know, GRP thinks, I, I think, we think as an organization that there are going to be many players that are going to come to light either within a niche or at a, at a top level view that are going to survive for a little bit, fall off, rise to the top again, just like in anything in, in, in business. But I think the long, the, the real long story of it is, or the long view in it is how monopolistic the big companies are going to be in acquiring their competitors who have a piece of technology that they don't have that then ultimately then just rolls up to what they control taking everybody else out of of the you know of the bottom so that i think that's yet to be determined but i think you're going to see hundreds if not thousands of companies come out with some some type of ai and adam was just talking about it in predictive dialing or analytics or whatever you know he's he's using it for for his own business acumen but i think as new entrepreneurs come into this space you're just going to see new innovation and it's just this it's just a race to uh to who gets acquired first and then thereafter it's going to be i was going to say josh to i expect it to be like like ad like banner advertising on the internet it's it was just a yeah. battle of consolidation you know 12 years ago or something if if adam was like hey harrison let's go buy some display traffic I'd go and sign like 15 IOs with different ad networks. Today, I'd be like, well, I'm just going to go buy some shit on DoubleClick, maybe LabNexus or Verizon. You know, that's it. Now, you know, now it's just Google. Yeah, and I think Adam, and I think Adam's right, which is you might not, and correct me, I'm trying to translate what you said, Adam, or speak ahead, but the data, right? Yeah. 
you're, they're not going to use their technology. They're just going to go buy whatever the, the the data that they leveraged from the technology that they had, and they're going to aggregate it into their own platform. Well, it's the training data that that has the most value. So, right. for instance, like. For our predictive routing, I know my competitors can't make what we built because they don't have as much data as we do. And so the data drives the training and the training then drives the accuracy of the model. Right. And so an interesting thing I read about this a couple of years ago, and it's coming true, is one of the things that China has against the United States that we cannot replicate, or India for that instance, is their population is so much bigger than ours, they have way more data to collect off of them. So there are certain things that we won't be able to model as well simply because there's not enough physical metadata being thrown off the humans. Right. And so, um, you know, I think companies like Quora uh, have a really interesting data set where they have like all these questions answered over the last 30 years or wikipedia they have every single edit of every single whatever so that they can piece together time-based changes of events and um you know youtube with video and facebook and twitter with their social data sets so basically it's going to become an arms race of acquisition for the data and whoever has the most data um, is going to win the models but to your point i think you hit the nail on the head you made made one little prediction there and that is what will happen is there will be thousands of like micro niches or highly specialized uh, machine learning or AI, whatever you want to call it, companies that are tackling one specific little task where they have the data that someone else doesn't. We're a perfect example, right? The predictive routing for inbound calls, exactly that. Like you'll see thousands or tens of thousands of startups that have unique data sets. It's all going to come down to PND, right? Pay need desire. So where where mm -hmm. does the where does the the conglomerate have their pay need desire? Where wh what what does that need to be? And they're going to go look for it and rather than build it they're going to acquire it, which is an investment thesis for why why M&A works to begin with. Now, will it live on a top aggregate level? I don't know. Will it be siloed into, you know, we talk about vertical integration? So an insurance company will then go after what's what's a, an affinity within the insurance vertical and financial services and education and banking. That's yet to be seen because a lot of the bigger players have a lot of those tentacles already out there in a lot of different divisions. But I think I think it's going to be interesting to see. All I know is that if you're not already using it and if you're not learning how to leverage it as a business, you know, GRP believes that it's the best form of Darwinism there is, which is adapt and survive. <laughs> and if you don't, you're going to die off. And we're, we are, we are very bullish on AI and it's, it's, it's what we believe is going to take a large portion of our business to the next level and there, and, and thereafter. Well, boys, rest in peace to I the think competition. Regulation has a lot to do with it too. Regulation will, will, will dictate a lot of that in the industry. Like you mentioned financial services, I think banks, continue to automate things and anti-fraud processes, et cetera. But I think there is a fine line because regulators will be- Regulation is happens. something that I think everyone learns to not only- To love live, hate. To, to live with, but use it as as a bench. I've I've lived my life, my career. We we at GRP has lived lived there, our, 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 our career by- Learn from what the regulation is trying to achieve, sure, like and that. be better than everybody else who's who's either you know behind the eight ball on it or doesn't want to recognize what it's looking to try to the problem that it's trying to solve. Sure, there are certain things that are we can all agree that are too too wide and 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 wide ranging or far reaching, but that's a conversation for a different day. But I think if you if you really are in this space, in any space, you have to learn how to extrapolate what the regulators are really trying to achieve and then take that and, and become entrepreneurial around that. Entrepreneurs will always figure out a way how to adapt. That's just the, the essence of what it means to be an entrepreneur. Josh, this was dope, man. You're a Thanks great guest. Me. I Thanks threw this topic me. in like last second. I thought it'd be like a five or a 10 minute like little add on, but I had no idea you were so involved in the AI space. So that was, 
That was awesome. And I do got to Hopefully I pretended oh, to Oh, wait, hold on. I was going to say I do have to send a special thank you to Greg for not being able to show up today. We appreciate <laughs> it. But Josh Greg said he would come on so we could just destroy him and he he wimped out. So fucking A, man. It's uh, Adam, <laughs> okay. I've heard I've heard uh, only so many good things about everyone on the show, but uh, Greg speaks very highly of you and he thinks uh thinks your business is, is doing tremendous things. And uh, I, I, we would love to figure out a way, obviously, to do more business together as as uh, as we grow, too. Well, now that I know that you're running the ship over <laughs> there, I'd be happy to do business with you guys. OK, Hit so that's so that's time. been that, so that's been the uh, <laughs> that's been the roadblock. I got it <laughs> for for myself, Josh. From OfferVault.com, Adam Young, the CEO of Ringba Harrison, not a marketing guru, don't forget it, as well as Josh Album, the CEO of GRP Ads. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the Affiliate Marketing Show. We'll see you next time, everybody. Take care.